This is the first slide of the uh, first real lecture in uh, NR GR 323-503, um, the introductory remote sensing class for both undergraduates and graduates. Uh, this slide is the first, or this lecture is the first lecture in a, a five-part series. Um, on the remote sensing basics. So we're going to discuss what is light, what is color, atmospheric scattering, surface characteristics, and then commonly used spectral bands. But before that, we're just going to look at this very simple drawing, giving you an idea of the remote sensing process. Um, on the left, you see um, the observations that we make. You can see the A there, the next to the sun. That's a energy source. Most of remote sensing that we do um, uses the sun as an energy source. Um, you can see B. There's some interaction between that energy and the atmosphere. Talk about that in atmospheric scattering. Light travels through the atmosphere and down to the surface of the Earth. And then there's some fraction of that energy that uh, is reflected from a, a feature of interest. That fraction differs with the uh, color of light that's being reflected. There's retransmission of the uh, light through the atmosphere. And then you can see there that light is going to be uh, recorded by um, some, um, some kind of sensor system. There it's a satellite, uh, but it could be uh, an airborne sensing system. Um, I should say that that is the um, typical kind of remote sensing. We call that passive remote sensing passive in the sense that um, it uses environmental sources of energy. So that could either be reflected light. Uh, it could be the light that's emitted from an object on the surface of the Earth. Um, and that, in addition, we have active remote sensing. So active remote sensing the sensor itself is generating the energy that's used um, in interactions with whatever object we're interested with. So for instance, that could be uh, emitted microwave energy for radar remote sensing. It could be emitted um, uh, visible or near infrared energy um, in the form of a laser. Um, it could also be sonar, sonar, excuse me, uh, information, uh, energy. So sound waves being emitted by the uh, sensor. And those are active remote sensing systems. Um, the result of those kinds of um, remote sensing, um, you have data products, um, could be film, uh, pictorial remote sensing. Um, it could be a digital form that could either be images or related types of data. Um, you then get to your interpretation and analysis of images, and that could be visible interpretation. Um, so you're observing with your eyes what's going on and maybe annotating that in either uh, in a physical system or uh, electronic system, or the data that you've collected using your active or passive system could be uh, going into a, a digital system for processing. And much of what we'll discuss will be digital image processing. The result of the interpretation analysis will be information products. So maps, measurements, um, images, um, and then those information products are 
circulated to users. Um, you know, in most of this course, we will focus on um, the idea that natural um, resource managers will be the final users, although it could be, say, urban planners as well, uh, it could be geologists, any number of um, uh, actors could be the recipient of the information products. So now we'll get to a series of topics on light. Um, what is light? We'll address that. Um, what are the different kinds of light? And how does light relate to what we see in remotely sensed images? Light is electromagnetic energy, which is generated by several mechanisms. So changes in the energy level of electrons within atoms, uh, the decay of radioactive substances, and the thermal motion of atoms and molecules. All three can generate photons, uh, which are electromagnetic energy. Um, for the sun, it's nuclear reactions within the sun that produce a, a spectrum of electromagnetic radiation um, between about 0.1 and 100 micrometers. So uh, 0.1 uh, micrometers, that's in the, the ultraviolet wavelengths. Between 0.4 and 0.7, those are the visible wavelengths. Between 0.7 and 1.3 micrometers, that's the uh, near infrared and so on. We'll discuss these in, in greater detail. That figure shows you the black body radiation curve at the sun's temperature. So objects that are black bodies, we will discuss this as part of thermal uh, remote sensing. Objects that are black bodies um, emit energy um, as a function of their temperature alone. So um, that curve shows you the amount of energy being emitted by a black body radiation, by black bodies, excuse me, um, at the sun's temperature, which is about 6,000 degrees Kelvin. Uh, the wavelengths here are special, uh, specified in micrometers, but they can also be specified in nanometers. So, um, a micrometer is a thousand nanometers. So that range there would be between uh, 100 and 100,000 nanometers. So again, where is electromagnetic radiation coming from? The sun is the most obvious source. However, all matter at temperatures above absolute zero, i.e. zero degrees Kelvin or negative set, 273 centigrade emit electromagnetic radiation. So the sun on the left, on the right, we have, you know, I don't know if those are horses or zebras. Um, either a horse or a zebra. Um, and in that image, we're showing the, the temperature as, um, a pseudo color image. So objects that appear blue are colder, objects that are red or white are hotter. Um, and the amount of electromagnetic uh, radiation an object generates is just a function of its temperature. We can conceive of electromagnetic radiation um, as a wave that travels through space um, at the speed of light, uh, which is when you're going through a vacuum, um, three times eight, 10 to the eighth uh, meters per second, which is about 186,282 miles per second. Um, a useful relationship for quick calculations is that light travels about 30 centimeters per nanosecond. And light can also be thought of as packets of energy. 
Now the wavelength of light is defined as the distance between maximums or minimums uh, or um, um, the points at which the curve intercepts uh, zero of a roughly periodic pattern, which is normally measured in micrometers or nanometers. So we're talking about a physical uh, distance that's characterizing the, the light. Frequency is the number of wavelengths that pass a point per unit time. So a wave that sends one crest by every second, completing one cycle, is said to have a frequency of one cycle per second, or one hertz. So there's an inverse relationship between wavelength and frequency. Okay, so if you have a relatively long wavelength, okay, traveling at the speed of light, you're gonna have a lower frequency. That is, fewer um, wavelengths are going to pass by a point as a function of time. Now, as you shorten the wavelength, you're going to have a larger number uh, passing by a point as a function of time. So this can be shown um, as equations. So we have uh, the symbols for the wavelength, lambda, uh, frequency, v, um, and C, the speed of light. So three relationships here. The speed of light is related to or equal to um, the wavelength times the frequency. So if you know how long the wavelength is, you know how many times it's passing beyond a, a point, then the speed of light is just one multiplied by the other. Um, the frequency is equal to the speed of light divided by wavelength. So if you cut up um, a distance of the speed of light by that many wavelengths, then what you're left with is the frequency. And alternatively, the wavelength is equal to the frequency divided by the speed of light. So the longer the wavelength, the lower the frequency. And this is my first opportunity to tell you that um, for almost all of the equations that I present as part of this course, um, you are responsible for knowing how the variables are related but I don't ask you to do calculations. Um, so you'll never see a, you know, a question of given the speed of light and the wavelength, what's the frequency? So all objects give off or emit electromagnetic energy. The type of energy being emitted is a function of the temperature. And as the temperature increases, the amount of energy increases and the wavelength gets shorter. So if you look to the left at that figure on the x-axis, you have um, the wavelength in micrometers and the y-axis as the relative radiated energy. And you have various objects at various temperatures starting at 79 degrees Kelvin, which is liquid air, um, 195 degrees Kelvin, which is dry ice, um, 300 degrees Kelvin, which is the average temperature of the Earth, um, all the way up to 6,000 degrees Kelvin, which, as I said, is the sun. And as you go up in temperature, number one, the area under the curve increases, so that's the, the relative energy being emitted, and you can see the peak um, of each curve moves towards shorter wavelengths. Um, and right there near the peak of the 6,000 degree Kelvin or sun curve is the portion of the spectrum that is visible light. So the sun gives off um, its maximum energy 
in the range of wavelengths that we consider to be visible. And there's a simple relationship um, that allows you to predict the wavelength of maximum emission as a function of temperature. So this is Wien's displacement law, and it just says that the wavelength of maximum emission, the top of that curve, is equal to a constant divided by temperature, and that constant is 2,898 micrometer degrees Kelvin. Again, I'll never ask you to make this calculation, but I may ask you to tell me as the temperature increases, what's happening to the wavelength. So some various units of length used in remote sensing, and I, I wanna stress that when you're thinking about wavelengths, you're thinking about physical distances. Now, we wouldn't use um, kilometer to um, describe a, um, a wavelength, but some remote sensing can use um, wavelengths on the, um, the same, you know, roughly the a wavelength of a meter, that's microwave energy or centimeter, which is also in the microwave. Past the, the centimeter wavelengths, we have millimeters. So the, um, the scanning devices that they use in airports, you know, the ones that you stand up in with your, your hands up in the air, that's millimeter um, light that's used. Um, the micrometer, um, again is that's a millionth of a meter and that's very often used to describe light um, in the, the visible and what we'll call the near infrared um, and then the others that's used um, is the nanometer okay and that's just um, a thousand times there are a thousand nanometers in each micrometer Angstrom, we don't really use that often. So the sun emits energy in a very wide range of um, wavelengths. So everything from 10 to the negative 12 meters, um, so very small. So those are gamma rays and X rays. Um, wavelengths of around 10 to the negative eight, so that's ultraviolet light. Um, we then have the visible, and you can see that the visible is actually a very small uh, portion of the energy that's emitted by the sun, a very small part of that range. Um, so this is a log scale, so that's even you know, smaller than it appears. Um, so then we have between like 10 to the negative 6 and 10 to the negative 2, um, that's the infrared portion of the spectrum. And then um, at the longer wavelengths, so like between uh, 10 meters and a 10th or a hundredth of a meter, sorry, that would be microwaves and uh, radio waves. So we can pull out the visible and we can look at photon energy. So smaller uh, wavelengths have more energy. Okay, longer wavelengths, as you might think, have lower energy. And this is relatively easy to remember because, you know, the very shortest wavelengths, um, things like gamma radiation and have x-rays, um, those have enough energy to pass through your body, uh, sometimes causing damage on the way. Again, showing an even, a smaller range of um, the spectrum. We can look at um, the, the common wavelengths that we would see on the Earth. And, you know, that's everything. Um, you can ignore the, the left set of, of numbers there that go between 0.41 and 0.5. 
3.1. Those are uh, in units of electron volts, which we don't use very often. But um, on the right, we can we can look at everything between 400 nanometers and 30,000 nanometers. And this is what we call the optical portion of the spectrum. And really all that means is it's the portion of the spectrum that acts like light that we're familiar with. So 400 nanometers is the uh, distinguishes between ultraviolet light and uh, violet light. 450 nanometers is where you go from violet to blue. Um, green is 500 to 550. Um, yellow is 580 to 600. Orange is 600 to 650. And red is 650 to 700. Um, in general, for simplicity's sake, I only talk about blue between 400 and 500 nanometers, green 500 and 600 nanometers, and red 600 and 700 nanometers. Beyond red, we have the near infrared. So infra just means beyond red. Um, and the near infrared is just that portion of the infrared that sort of is adjacent to red. And um, the, the near infrared, here it specifies it as between 700 and 1,000. More generally, I use 700 to 1,300 uh, nanometers as the near infrared. Um, there's then a portion of the infrared between 1,300 and 3,000 nanometers. That's the shortwave infrared. And then between 3,000 and 14,000 is the thermal infrared. And beyond that, um, 13,000 to 30,000 is the far infrared. And there'll be a figure that breaks that out that same way. So the sun approximates a 6,000 degree Kelvin black body. It has a, um, a dominant wavelength of 480 nanometers. And in the figure to the left, you can see um, the breakdown of light from the sun. You can see it follows um, that typical curve for a black body. 41% um, of the energy is in the visible, about 9% is in the ultraviolet, and 50% is in uh, what we generally specify as the near or uh, the near infrared. Um, so one thing to note here is that half the energy from the sun is in the near infrared. And so we don't generally, um, um, we can't see the near infrared, but there's an awful lot of energy there. So near infrared is going to be very important for remote sensing. And here it's near infrared and just a little bit um, into the mid infrared. Um, and you can see here blue, green, and red. Um, they have approximately the same amount of energy. So that's um, the distribution of the sun's energy. The Earth, because it's a 300 degree Kelvin black body, its dominant wavelength is much longer. It's about 9,660, you know, roughly 10,000 nanometers. And you can see that you that is in longer wavelengths. And we're going to make a distinction between um, reflected electromagnetic energy and emitted um, electromagnetic energy. So you can see there's a there's a point at which there's a gap between um, energy that's been emitted from the sun and then reflected from an object and energy that's been emitted from an object 
as a function of the Earth's temperature. And as a consequence, we can talk about reflected versus emitted um, radiation. This is just a function of the contrasting temperatures between um, the sun and the Earth. Um, if the Earth um, was hotter, then it would have shorter wavelengths and there might not be a clear cut distinction between the reflective and um, the emitted infrared. Or so this will give you uh, a breakdown of, in general, the various wavelengths. So um, ultraviolet is about um, 300 to 380 nanometers. Um, the visible, uh, that which we see uh, between 380 and 720 nanometers. Near infrared, again, about 720 through 1300 nanometers. Mid infrared, 1300 to 3000. And far infrared or thermal infrared, uh, 3000 to 14000. And you can see there's some slop in terms of how we refer to things, you know. I've got both the, the longer and the shorter names here, near infrared, NIR, I will say as well, mid infrared or MIR, uh, shortwave infrared um, or SWIR, and then far infrared, FIR, also known as the thermal infrared, TIR. And then we have the microwave and the radio portions of the spectrum. I don't talk about those as much. And um, in the visible spectrum, we can see there are um, six colors being identified there. Again, you know, I tend to, or I will, uh, lump together violet and blue, so 400 to 500. Um, green and uh, yellow and orange between 500 and 600. Uh, nanometers and then red between 600 and 700 and part of that is because as we'll see those are the independent ranges of color that your eyes can see and we'll discuss that um, and so um, we refer to to intervals of wavelength of frequencies um, in the electromagnetic uh, spectra as bands or channels or regions. So the visible spectrum 400 to 700 nanometers and this is a very small portion of the um, electromagnetic spectrum that's emitted by the sun. The longest visible wavelength is red and the shortest is violet. And this is the only portion of the electromagnetic spectrum that we associate with the idea of colors. Um, but there's a lot of radiation that's invisible to us. Um, and you can go ahead and think of any other part of the spectrum as a color. You know, there's, there's no distinction except the distinction that this is where the peak energy of the sun is. And because there's a lot of energy in that range of wavelengths, um, in the course of evolution, um, the light sensing organs tended to um, look for light where there's a lot of it. And otherwise there's nothing really special about the visible portion of the spectrum. And this gives you this idea, um, you know, the, you have the, the spectrum from uh, blue to red. You have the emission of energy from the sun. So that we call that the solar irradiance, the amount of energy being uh, emitted as a function of wavelength. And then that dash line is the daylight sensitivity. So the portion of the spectrum that your eyes are sensitive to. Uh, and as you can see, it matches up with 
where there is a lot of energy being emitted from the sun. Um, it's an interesting experiment, uh, I think, conceptually. Um, Herschel is the first scientist to describe um, infrared light. So his experimental setup was he has a, a box, he has a prism, and he has three thermometers. And then the prism is aligned, so the spectrum falls on uh, the three thermometers. And what he finds is that temperatures increase um, from the blue uh, through the yellow, but they increase even where light isn't seen, which he then concludes that there must be light that he can't see, which I think is a remarkable uh, conceptual advance because until that moment, light is always what you can see. Uh, and he suddenly says, no, there are kinds of light that we can't see. So, the light that he was seeing the effect of is infrared light, and it covers the wavelength from 0.7 to 100 micrometers, um, or 700 to 100,000 nanometers. And so that's a, a more than 100 times as wide as the visible portion of the spectrum. So we have seen that it can be divided into the reflected infrared um, and the emitted or thermal infrared. And there you can see uh, on this slide at the bottom, the ranges I use, near infrared, 700 to 1300 nanometers, middle infrared, 1300 to 3000 nanometers, and the emissive or thermal infrared, 3000 to 14,000 nanometers. There's also the photographic infrared. And the photographic infrared, which is 700 to 900 nanometers, is just defined as the portion of the infrared that uh, you can pick up on infrared film. So that's a limitation of, of film that it can only record energy up to 900 nanometers. So we don't, because we use film less and less, um, photographic infrared as a range isn't used very often anymore. Um, again, thermal infrared energy is given off by the Earth um, and the objects on it because they're relatively cool. Um, and then reflected infrared energy is given off by the sun, which is hot. And again, because the sun is so much hotter than the earth, they occupy different ranges of the spectrum. Uh, so if you're a sensor and you're observing um, energy between, you know, roughly 250 to 2,500 nanometers, you're seeing light that has been emitted by the sun and reflected off the surface of the earth. Conversely, if you're seeing energy between 3,500 and 30,000 nanometers, then you must, you're seeing energy that's been emitted by objects on the surface of the earth as a function of their temperature. Uh, the microwave region. So this is a portion of the spectrum that's of more recent interest. Um, and so this is everything from about one millimeter to one meter. And these are the longest wavelengths used for remote sensing, um, only because if you get beyond the microwave, then you get into um, VHF, very high frequency um, uh, portions of the spectrum. And that's where um, television signals are broadcast. Um, presuming that they're still broadcasting um, and it's not all cable, but I guess some people still have antennas. Um, and so we don't use the energy beyond the microwave because all of the bands in this 
in this range of wavelengths um, are um, generated by active sensors. So if you were generating VHF energy, you'd be interfering with television signals. Um, so the longer wavelengths um, are behave more like radio or television broadcasts, shorter wavelengths have properties that are similar to the thermal infrared in the way they behave. Um, you can see there are a number of different bands, uh, the P band, the L band, SC, X band, the KU, the K, then the KA through B, I'm sorry, the KA band, uh, and then the millimeter band and the submillimeter band. Um, there is no order to the letters that are used for the various different bands. Um, and the reason is that um, microwave, microwave region is used for radar and radar was a military, um, military technology. And so they wanted to confuse spies. Um, and so they just gave them sort of a, um, names that were random as a function of wavelength. And so that would confuse people. It unfortunately also confuses people who do remote sensing. So we can look at the path of energy from the sun to a sensor. So energy is a passive sensor radiated from the sun so generated by nuclear re reactions, it travels through space um, at the speed of light, no practical attenuation or loss of energy. Um, it interacts with the atmosphere, so it can either be scattered or absorbed. It then interacts with the Earth's surface, so it could be absorbed or reflected. It then interacts with the atmosphere again, scattered or absorbed, and then detected by some kind of remote sensing uh, technology. The atmospheric um, uh, transit is an important one because um, not all the energy gets through the atmosphere, okay? So at the top, we have atmospheric opacity. So, um, 100% opacity means the energy is going to be uh, absorbed 100% by the atmosphere. 0% opacity, 100% um, is going to be um, uh, transmitted through the atmosphere. And so you can see um, almost all the energy, you know, gamma rays, X rays um, at the left of the diagram um, are going to be absorbed by the atmosphere. You then have the visible. So the visible is um, a low opacity um, portion of the, the spectrum. So um, that makes it, um, a lot of it is getting through the atmosphere and is another reason why visible light is visible. Um, again, your eyes have evolved to use that portion of the spectrum not only because there's a lot of energy coming from the sun, but also it's getting through the atmosphere. You can then see that for the, the near infrared and the mid infrared, um, it's a complex pattern. And in fact, we do remote sensing in these portions of the spectrum, but uh, we have to very carefully select what bands we're looking at, um, what ranges those bands have. Most of the infrared spectrum is absorbed by atmospheric gases. And then um, the microwave is easily observed. It passes right through the atmosphere, it passes through clouds. And that's one of the reasons why the microwave is used. Uh, because optical remote sensing, you have to worry about clouds. Um, and that's a big problem in areas that are very wet, places like uh, the the Pacific Northwest of the United States or the Amazon. So 
different objects or materials reflect or emit electromagnetic energy differently across the spectrum. Okay, so here's three examples. Um, soil um, um, reflects um, moderately well, like say 18% of light energy is reflected at that shortest wavelength, 0.4. Uh, micrometers or 400 nanometers and it increases its reflectance up through the um, the rest of the visible spectrum and then into the near infrared and then at the the sort of end of the near infrared um, and the mid infrared it sort of levels off so that's a soil signature if you see that you're pretty sure you're looking at a soil um, Water you can see reflects in the, the visible and then a little bit beyond into the near infrared um, and is very dark in general. Vegetation has um, probably the most distinct signature. Um, it's low reflectance in blue, at around 400 nanometers, um, and higher. Um, in the green, 500 to 600 nanometers, and then low again between 600 and 700 nanometers in red. So that's because um, vegetation is absorbing um, via chlorophyll energy in the blue and the red in order to drive photosynthesis. There's then this steep increase in reflectance between red and near infrared. Um, and that um, is a very strong signature that you're looking at vegetation. You get out into the mid infrared and there are these two um, features of lowered reflectance. Uh, those are water absorption features. So uh, you're looking at the energy that's being absorbed in uh, by the water that's actually in leaves. And when we're doing remote sensing, we're essentially taking multiple um, images of the scene we're interested in, and the uh, scenes look different in various portions of the um, the various portions of the spectrum. So here you have red, shortwave infrared, and thermal infrared, and you have different patterns as a function of wavelength. Um, areas that are high in reflectance are shown as white, low reflectance um, are dark. So a summary of what we've talked about, light is electromagnetic energy. It's emitted by all objects um, as a function of their temperature. The sun's energy emission peaks in the visible wavelengths, and that's why they're visible. Um, Remote sensors are detecting emitted energy at different wavelengths. We talked about what uh, the terminology for some of those wavelengths. And some wavelengths of energy pass through the atmosphere, others tend to be absorbed.